Roman General 23 asked me this. How did I get good at Zig? Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm still learning, um, but I have a couple of resources that I've been using, and I, I think they're really helpful. Um, I had to scour for some of these, so I wanted to make a video to show some of those off and help people find them a little easier than I did. Uh, so the secret sauce is right here in front of you. This is, a, this is my script. Uh, so let's go through and talk about these things. So the first one is zig.guide. Oops, that is not... Yeah, that's fine. Uh, zig.guide. So it's uh, exactly what it sounds like. If you pull up your browser, type zig.guide. Um, this is really nice. And you can see the version that it's for, which is zig 0.13.0, uh, which is the current uh, release of zig, uh, if you're not running off of like the master branch. Um, and it walks you through the high level of just about everything. So uh, installing, what a hello world looks like, how to run tests, uh, this is nice because your your default application comes with a test. So being able to see that and kind of run that from the start is helpful. Um, and then it goes into everything. So there's information on assignment, arrays, expressions. Uh, the caveat here is that this is it. Like, so if you want to learn about functions, this is all the content you have for functions in this guide. It's great if you know how functions work. This is great uh, if you know how defer works. Maybe you're coming from Go. Um, so that's, you know, it's it's helpful uh, information about errors. This one's a little more in-depth, which is great because errors are a little more uh, important to handle appropriately. Uh, not that deferring things isn't, but um, the way that Zig does errors is very different than anything else. So uh, it's nice to have more content on that, I guess, is what I'm getting at. But uh, the short and sweet is that the Zig guide is, is really helpful. Uh, I was referring to this a lot, especially the standard library section. When I first started writing Zig, um, one of the first things I was working on was a CLI that was interacting with the file system. So I refer to this a lot. As you can see, though, it's not a ton of content. Um, so that's that's the guide. Uh, so that was one of the first things that I stumbled upon and started looking into. Um, I'll call out specifically the build system is uh, this leaves a lot to be desired. And and it, don't get me wrong, there's still a fair chunk of information about the build system here. Um, but the build system is really complex uh, and it's, it's really powerful and it, and it should be uh, maybe maybe should be is not the right word. But that complexity is is worth it. But it's really hard to grok and. Um, yeah, finding documentation for the build system is kind of a pain. I mentioned that in my video uh, about hating the Zig build system when I first started. A lot of how I learned to use the Zig build system was through looking at the source code of the build system, uh, which isn't very accessible. So hopefully, you know, as a community, we can rally around this and, and find a better way to teach people about the build system. Um, the second thing, uh, yeah, Zig book. Wow, okay, I probably should have started with this one. Uh, this is it. Pedro Park, uh, Pedro Park, sorry, 99. Uh, he has this Zig book and it's all open source. Uh, you can buy a copy on Amazon if you want to support him. Both they have an ebook on Kindle or a physical one. I'm not him. I'm not sponsored by him. Uh, I just started reading this the other day and found it really, really nice. Um, there are a couple things that I'm not 100% sure are correct. So somewhere in here, it mentions uh, package manager. Um, the second generative file, build.zig.zon, is the Zig package manager. Uh, yes, Zig has a package manager like pip and Python uh, called Zon. I, I don't think that's entirely true. I thought Zon was short for Zig object notation, but I, I could be wrong on that. Again, I'm still learning too. And to be honest, the what this acronym stands for hasn't really been super relevant. But the point I'm getting at is like, this is way more in depth than the Zig guide. It's all open source. It's all available online to read if you would like. Um, and I've started reading through this just the other day uh, and got to section three, memories and allocators. So uh, once I finish with this video, that's probably what I'll continue doing is reading through this. Um, tons of information though. It seems really, really useful. And then there are projects along the way too, which I think is really nice. It helps put everything together. So building a base 64 encoder decoder, building an HTTP server, building a stack, uh, developing an image filter. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. I actually don't even know how to approach this. So I'm looking forward to getting to this section and figuring out how to build an image filter. Um, I guess in theory, you would just iterate through each pixel and change the values of the pixel, darkening them, but either way. Uh, and then the part that I'm actually really most excited about is, uh, this section 16, which talks about introducing threads and parallelism, because I'm not 100% sure what this looks like in Zig at this point. Okay. 
so yeah, this book, uh, again, Pedro Park 99, uh, it's available online. It's open source. Uh, you can pay for a copy if you'd like to support the author and maybe, maybe you should, um, you know, it's <laughs> nice to be compensated for the effort you put into these things and it helps encourage the author to put out more work like this. Uh, what else? Ziglings. Yeah. Okay, cool. Ziglings. So, um, this is not the right link anymore, but if you click this link, it'll show you the right link. Uh, and this takes you to Codeberg, which I don't know what is going on with Codeberg and where it's coming from. Um, this seemed like it came out of nowhere. Maybe it didn't. Uh, maybe the, I just started seeing this when I started doing more stuff with Zig, but a lot of um, Zig projects are hosted on Codeberg instead of GitHub. Either way, uh, this one's really neat. I haven't started this yet, but I've looked through some of the tasks and how it, how the, the uh, project works. But the idea here is that you're learning Zig by fixing tiny broken programs. So uh, cute little graphic, some information about Zig. Uh, they do recommend you use a development build of Zig for this. Uh, so there's information on that. Uh, cloning the repository and then running Zig build to get started. Um, here's what's covered. So if you'd like to know what you're learning, uh, you know, hello world, uh, standard libraries, assignments, basically a lot of the things that were covered in the Zig guide, um, but uh, a little more in depth. So if you want like a hands-on exercise for that, that would be, uh, this would be the approach for that. And you can see here, like you can build a single exercise, you can run all the exercises, random exercises, uh, those type of things. Um, but yeah, you'll interact with the Zig build system to do these exercises. So if you take a look at like this hello world one, uh, you can see, oh no, this is supposed to print hello world, but needs your help. Zig functions are private by default, but the main function should be public. Here's information on how to do that. The fix for this one, uh, is just adding, you know, the pub modifier before this function keyword. Um, they get a little more involved too, right? So we could go all the way down and grab something like the unions one, and you can learn about unions uh, and how they let you store different types and sizes of data in the same memory address. Um, and then information on how it's possible too, which I think is really nice. Either way, um, these little exercises are bite-sized projects that really focus on one particular piece of the language at, uh, at a time um, and are really quite interesting. So hopefully this is a resource that can be helpful too. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the next one is a uh, Zig standard library. Um, this as fun as this is to point people to, this is how I've learned most of what, uh, I've been doing in Zig. So learning the standard library is uh, helpful and we should probably talk about one thing. So Zig is small. Like the, the language itself is quite small. The standard library is robust. I wouldn't say it's large. It's not like Python standard library or Go standard library, but it's sufficient. Um, but the standard library is where a lot of the complexity starts to creep into the language, which totally makes sense. But uh, yeah, looking at some of the things in the standard library can be helpful. And I don't just mean like looking at the documentation here. So like, let's see, what, what have I been working at recently? Uh, we mentioned file systems. So seeing file systems, seeing directories, seeing what is available on a directory. So we have this access method. We have access W, which is access, but it, for Windows targets. Um, access Z, this is a common pattern, the W's and Z's when working with file systems uh, for, you know, different different OS's. Um, anyways, you, you can see things like that and you can click through the documentation and see, oh, this returns either a metadata error or metadata. So you can click into those and see what's going on here. Uh, but where this actually becomes really, really useful is if you were to, if we go back, went too far back, uh, and then we go here to GitHub, and we can actually look at how the standard library is implemented. So you can see here, lib, std, and then let's grab file system. And maybe we're curious how that directory, all those directory methods are implemented. We can look at the code right here. And if you don't know Zig, this can be challenging. Reading Zig code, especially stuff as uh, complex as the standard library, um, can, can be challenging. But I, I think the key thing here is take it slow, and if you don't know something, leverage the other tools that I've mentioned, like the, the guide here, to figure out what is going on. So maybe we don't know what struct is. So we can go to zig guide, we can find structs, and then you can see here, they're the most common kind of composite data type. That totally makes sense. You read through this, you learn what a struct is, you come back. Uh, 
so yeah, I, I think this is probably what I would recommend. Um, there's two more bonuses that I'll mention. Uh, actually, one's not even a bonus. Uh, so there's this website called Learn X and Y. Uh, if you haven't seen this yet, uh, I highly recommend it for just about anything. Um, if you know a programming language, this is a tool that helps you pick up the syntax of another programming language very, very quickly. So we can scroll down until we find Zig. There it is. You can get a quick overview of Zig compared to C. Uh, bu 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 as, a, as an aside, I love the way that TriCatch works in Zig. Uh, but then you can see, hey, here's a hello world. Here's how Booleans work uh, in integers and floats. Uh, here's how arrays work. Here's how multidimensional arrays work. Here's how strings work. Here's how slices work. Here's pointers, optional values, all that stuff. Um, this site's really, really nice if you know a language and want to learn another language. I will say, though, that unless you're coming from C specifically, and even if you are coming from C, you might still get tripped up on this. This section here, memory allocators, uh, this is this is essentially what makes Zig, um, well, there are a couple things that make Zig special and unique, but this is one of the big ones, uh, explicit memory allocation. This is hard. If you are coming from a high-level language with a garbage collector and you have no experience writing something where you have to manually manage memory, this is this is challenging. This this trips me up from time to time too. I will find myself in situations where I have to ask, am I do I really need to allocate here or can I avoid allocations? And a lot of times when it this it, it's it boils down to if you know the size at compile time, you probably don't need to allocate it. If you don't know the size, you're probably going to have to allocate. Um, there's some gotchas to that, so it's not as simple as that. But the point being that uh, memory allocation is it's it's tricky, especially if you're coming from a higher level language. But that's the selling point of Zig, right? Is the ability to do this and to control this and choose how things allocate. Um, you know, like for example, a game engine uh, in Zig, we might allocate a bunch of memory up front and give the user a loading screen instead of trying to allocate memory on the fly as we need it which, you know, could, could be problematic. We don't want to slow the game down while we're requesting space from the operating system. Um, so again, this is Zig. Like, this is why we do this. One of the reasons. Uh, and then my last one, so the bonus, um, you have to write Zig to learn Zig. Uh, you can read it as much as you want, but if you're not building things in the language, you're not going to learn it. That has been the selling point for me, um, or, or that has been what's worked well for me, I should say. And, uh, yeah, so like I have a couple different projects. Um, I have a video on this ADL. Uh, this was written in Dino. I'll link the video here if I can. Um, but I wrote this in Dino and I converted it to Zig. And the whole reason I did that was to learn Zig. I, well, one of the main reason I did that was to learn Zig. I also had some issues about the file size of the, the Dino binary, but, uh, yeah, so I did that. I'm doing the exact same thing with book. So I have another CLI here called book. This is simple terminal-based bookmarks. Um, so I'm taking it and I am converting it to Zig. Oh, I need to push. I haven't pushed in a while. Uh, but you can see here, like, I'm taking something I have already built. I know how to solve the problem in a language I'm comfortable with, Go in this case. Uh, and I'm converting it to a language that I'm a little less comfortable with. I'm learning. Um, so I'm looking at that. And I'm taking the opportunity to try new things, too. Like, I'm using an external library here called Clap, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, just rewriting it in Zig. Uh, again, maybe if you, if you end up looking at this, hopefully you'll see it at the time that this PR is finished. Uh, obviously this is still missing some implementations, but the idea here is that I'm pushing through that and uh, writing things in Zig and between the resources I've shown you and taking time to actually write things in Zig, I think you'll figure it out and become a pretty strong Zig dev in due time. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So if this was helpful, um, let me know in the comments below. And if you don't mind, I would love it if you subscribed and hung around on the channel. I, uh, really appreciate all the conversations I've had with people about Zig, Flutter, Go, um, and even TypeScript and Dino. So, uh, come join us and be a part of that. It's, it's really nice.